Today's episode of Digging the Crates is brought to you by Scratch Pro Audio, one of the UK's leading distributors and retailers of DJ and vinyl accessories, including brands like Innofader, Stokio, Zomo and Record Runner, the world's smallest portable record player. To find out more, go to scratchproaudio.co.uk. Digging the Crates. This is Digging the Crates. I'm Vice Beats. Welcome to Season 1, Episode 2 of the podcast, brought to you by The Find. An aspect of Digging the Crates is that the interviews are from various times. This time round is an interview which took place during the lockdown period for COVID-19, and I talked to a man whose first name has become instantly recognisable through TV, comedy, and, in the context of Digging the Crates, the host of one of the finest hip-hop podcasts around, Having supported his scene through interviews, champion artists and live events, our guest is one of the hip-hop scene's best-known ambassadors. This is Digging the Crates with Ramesh Ranganathan. And now for our feature presentation. All right, here, here we go. Hello, this is Ramesh Ranganathan, comedian, writer, future national treasure, and you are checking out Digging in the Crates with Vice Beats and The Find. Ramesh Ranganathan, welcome to Digging in the Crates. I appreciate it, thanks for your time. First off, I just wanted to ask you how you got into hip hop initially. Yeah. I guess not so much about first artists, but yeah. what your first exposure was. I look for a lot of people, I think, it's like older mates, do you know what I mean? Like I had like some older friends that are really into, you know, I'm of the age when like Public Enemy and NWA were sort of coming up as I was a kid. <laughs> and so I was hearing that kind of music from my mates who were listening to it and it was a weird one because like my parents you know I'm originally Sri Lankan my parents are really into or were really into and my mum still is into that kind of like disco and shit like that so when we didn't really hear that's all I heard like my mum and dad are really into music all we heard was like disco and reggae and stuff like that in the house and when they have friends around that's all they put on but they hadn't really um and so I'd sort of listen to a bit of that and then pop just from being a kid. So I hadn't really listened to anything. I think I got into, I think the first artist I remember really getting into even before hip hop was Prince. And I remember okay. like listening to a lot of Prince and stuff like that. But um, I had just hadn't heard any hip hop. And, it's, and when I remember like my mates listening to it, my older friends listening to it. And, um, and it just sounded so different to anything I'd been listening to or heard or whatever. And, I think there's something exciting. I think that's what what gets a lot of people into new music is when it just it just totally sounds mad. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. and I think you know, it's that whole thing of it just turns your expectations upside down of what you think music is or whatever. I remember being like, "What the fuck is this?" It just sounds <laughs> like you know, I just couldn't even process it. And and yeah. like, so the first time you hear it, you just go, this isn't music. <laughs> and then like, do you know what I mean? It was almost like just that. And then you suddenly like, this is, yeah, yeah, exactly. And then you're like, this is mad. And then I just got into it from there. And then I just started seeking it out, you know, but it was so difficult to be into hip hop back then because I think maybe HHC was just starting or had come about a little bit beforehand, but you just didn't know where to find the best stuff or you know i mean i grew up in i grew up in crawley and crawley is not known as one of the uk's major hip-hop hubs do you know what i mean there's no scene <laughs> yeah. so like you know there, and nobody i knew at school or anything was into it apart from you know like my older mates were into it but they were just into that and they were listening to it 
but also listening to dance and rock and whatever else they listen to. Like they happen to listen to a bit of hip hop. Whereas I wanted to just listen to hip hop after that. And I was like trying to really like dig down into it. And that was, um, I was sort of working like blindly for a long time. Do you know what I mean? Just trying to find whatever I could. Scrabbling about. Yeah, and also there weren't any, I, I got into Hip Hop Connection later, but I remember my early experiences of being into hip hop were like, there were no magazines that were specifically hip hop magazines. Yeah. And so you would get like a dance magazine and turn to the hip hop page. Yeah, where like it'd be DJ like, <laughs> Yeah, something like that, do you know what I mean? Where some guy had been tasked with reviewing the hip hop releases that <laughs> month, but he didn't really give a fuck. But he had to write a couple of paragraphs about it, or whatever. Yeah. And that would be my source for like trying to get the, the like get a heads up on what stuff to check out. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it was a pretty ignorant early uh, baptism. <laughs> so I mean, you said about HHC. Yeah. Once you kind of got into that point and you were like starting to understand it, who were you kind of finding was inspiring you a little bit more, and you feeling like, yeah, I'm feeling these guys. Well, it's weird. Uh, well, I mean, it started off with with Public Enemy and NWA and like yeah. the obvious ones like that. And then one of the things that I was really excited by was just a range of sounds within that one genre of music, you know? And I remember really getting into De La Soul yeah. and the whole Native Tongues group. And, you know, I just thought that I liked, I really fell in love with the whole Native Tongues collective, to be honest with you, like Tribe and Black Sheep and, and all mm. of them. I just felt just the variety of it was so great. I remember I, I remember loving Three Feet High and Rising. Yeah. And, then when, and then when De La Soul is Dead came out, uh, my, I don't know how many people, I don't know how common an experience this is for people, but I remember being really disappointed by I it. I was, yeah, thing. same. Because yeah. do you remember it was like, I bought the tape and it had, it had a comic strip for the skits. And De La Soul loves skits, don't they? But like, it had a little comic book in the inlay and you could follow the story yeah. of like what was happening. And it was like, it was weird because it was a load of people talking about how they didn't like the album. <laughs> and I was listening to it going, I don't like the album. Like, I think I might be one of these punk kids that they're fucking taking a piss out of. Because like, I just wasn't as into it as I was the previous one. But then, you know, as is the case with a lot of this stuff, I re you know, you get into it. Well, and then now I, I, I love that record, do you know what I mean? But at the time, I think maybe it's because it was, I think it's so hard for groups, particularly in hip hop when the music moves so quickly, to do a second album because yeah. you set out what your sound is in that first record. And then on the second record, people don't want you to do this exactly the same thing you did before. But then if you move too far away from it, people get pissed off, do you know what I mean? <laughs> so it's a weird, yeah. it's a weird kind of conundrum. Kind of get in. locked into it. Yeah. It is strange, you know, I mean, especially with people like Nas, where he was a teenager when he was setting out with his original projects, and yeah. now he's in his 40s, and like people are still saying, oh yeah, but nothing's ever going to be as good as it'll make. It's like, uh, I know, okay. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's so, it's so mad because obviously Illmatic has got an unfair advantage because it, it, I know that he did like, you know, he appeared on tunes, that's what made his name. That was the first time you heard an album of a kid with that style. Yeah. And so every other album after, but then the same thing happened with it, it was written, wasn't it? It's was like, I, I, I was disappointed. <laughs> I was like gutted when I heard that album <laughs> the first time. I was like, fucking hell. I think because even the lead single with Lauren Hill. Yeah. Um, I remember thinking, shit, this isn't, this is so different to what I thought Nas is going to come out with as his lead single off the next album. So, but then you sort of go, oh, okay, well, it has moved on. I mean, a lot of people would argue that Nas has never matched up to what he's done in Illmatic, but no. I don't think so. I it's, think it's. There's I, some gems, aren't there? Right? Yes, yeah, yeah 100%. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. just kind of the warmness. Yes. Yeah. It's interesting, though. The music you seem to, to listen to, it literally seems like you're just into all aspects of hip hop culture, and it's from, from you doing stuff yourself. To, yeah. to also the artists you're into. I don't know, like I know on my side, whether it's getting older or whatever it is, I'm leaning towards the lyrical stuff. I know I like it. Like if there's a trumpet or sax in it, like, I know I'm sold on it already. But like it's yeah. kind of, yeah, yeah. are you, do you find that there's, even though I know you like into a wide range, do you find that there's yeah. a certain sound that 
as soon as you hear a certain element, you think, yes, that's the thing. The truth is, is I did think that I had that. I thought that I knew, you know, I, so, similar to you, I can't abide by if I think the rapper's shit on a track. Yeah. Like, I, I just can't, or if they don't have, because so many of my favorite artists, I could just listen to them do anything. Like for example, I'm a, I love Sean Price, right? And I just think that I could listen to Sean Price forever. I just love his style. I love the way I love his voice. I love the way the, the, his cadence, the, the the flow of it, the, the everything, the way everything fits together, and even the stuff he talks about. I love all of that. Yeah. And and so that's always going to be. If I don't like the rapper, if I don't think the rapper's good, or I don't think they've got a charisma. It's not even. I used to think it was about having all these multi-syllabics and all that shit, but I don't anymore. I think it's about charisma. Mm. Just having an authenticity to your sound, do you know what I mean? That it doesn't sound like anybody else. And it's like, you know, you listen to like a guru, you know, you wouldn't argue that guru's got the most complex style. No, but it's but him. You, but it's him, exactly, yeah. do you know what I mean? And so that's what makes him as a rapper so appealing. And so it's always, it was always to me like about the lyrics and about the style of the rapper. But I think like, and I know that he's a lot of people's favorite rapper, but you listen to someone like Doom yeah. and Doom, you listen to him and a lot of the time, I don't know what the fuck he's on about, <laughs> but but his voice is an instrument in the mix. Do you know what yeah. I mean? And, and I like the way it sounds and I don't necessarily follow what he's going on about. You could argue the same about a lot of Raycon stuff. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I sort of listen to it and I go, I've not followed this story <laughs> at all. But like, but you still, you still enjoy listening to it. Do you know what I mean? Your so, head like this sounds yeah, great. exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that sounds like shit, man. Yeah, that sounds like those guys, those guys really did uh, do something wrong there. I can't follow what it was yeah. in any shape or form. Um, but so, but I, I do think so. I do think I've started to appreciate the fact that there's. It's not just about spitting these incredible metaphors and shit like that. It's also about the musicality of it and, you know, and I remember like when I used to, I mean, I was absolutely fucking dreadful at it, but when I used to like try and freestyle or whatever or do these battles and shit like that, I remember one of the things that I was really crap at was feeling the music of it. I was very much into, I need to have some incredible diamond hard metaphor to put somebody down, but actually, you know, the actual musical side of it, I wasn't, I didn't have any swagger for want of a better yeah. word, do you know what I mean? So like, <laughs> and I think that, and I think since doing, you know, obviously from doing the podcast and it, it's forced me in many ways to listen to a wider range of hip hop than even I was listening to. And yeah. I think like, I think I'm a bit more accepting. I went through a phase of like, I'd only listen to stuff that came out of like a fucking one borough or something like that of New York. <laughs> you never really get so anal about it. But now like, I'm a little bit more, um, I don't know if it's partly from getting older, but partly from just ex listening to more and more a wider range of music, you sort of go, well, actually, I'm not gonna get angry if something doesn't fit what my remit of what a thing is. You're about to embark on the most wonderful experience of your life. I will not explain at this moment how and why it works. I don't have the time, it just does. Today, I am going to tell you about a great and wonderful man. DJ Doty, Doty. An English You said about the, the freestyling side, and am I right yeah. in thinking that like you've dabbled with the DJ in front and everything? Like, you've done all sorts well, of things. Well, I, I, I've started, I've started, I've just literally on lockdown. So, so what happened was is that when um, I did a show for Sky with Rob Beckett uh, called Rob and Ron, Rob and Romish Versus, yeah, and um, they tried to base it on on interests and stuff that we don't know anything about. So obviously the producers <laughs> know that I'm into hip hop, and I talked and we talked about doing a DJ thing because Rob is not really a hip hop fan at all, mm. but uh, and his theory was that. Um, DJs, they're on a bit of a con basically, do you know what I mean? They go and make loads of money from playing other people's music and they're not really cre creatively contributing. But from my side, as a, as a hip hop fan, DJs are very different in hip hop yeah. than they are in other in other genres of music. Yeah, and, it, and it's much more of a thing to it. So we talked about, so we ended up doing a show about DJing and I used to, I mean, I used to fuck about at my dad's pub, and like, <laughs> but I didn't used to play hip hop or anything like that. I used to play whatever, the drunk people of East Grinstead on it. But like, but then like from doing, cause like then um, as part of the show, 
Yoda sort of got to know Yoda. Yeah. Um, I, I I suggested to the producers that we have Yoda on to teach me how to do a bit nice. of like you know proper <laughs> like mixing. So Yoda was on the show and he showed me how to do a bit and. I just really got, if you're a hip hop fan, you grow up worshipping DJs, yeah. you know what I mean? And the only reason, the only reason I didn't do it when I was a kid is just because, the reason I did rapping and not DJing is because it's cheaper yeah. to start rapping, do you know what I mean? Like you <laughs> just can't, need a pen and paper. Exactly, whereas like with DJing, there's no, there was no way my parents were going to fork out for like 12 tens or whatever, yeah. do you know what I mean? So, so, but I always loved DJing, and so now, it's funny you mention this, but now we're on lockdown, I've just literally just bought myself a whole setup. Really? My wife thought I was joking, yeah, she thinks I've like, because <laughs> I, on the, so I'm doing a tour, I was doing a tour until Corona kicked in, Yeah. and on the tour, uh, the tour's called the Cynics Mixtape, and we have um, a DJ, Martin Too Smooth, comes and plays a hip hop set before I come on and do this, the show. And mine had been saying to me, I oh, listen, man, he goes like, you should give it a go. Like, it's, it's a laugh. It's a really fun thing to do. And he goes, and the other thing he said to me is he said, it will give you a greater appreciation for the music because you listen to it with a different ear. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, you're sort of into it a bit more. So we, when we got on lockdown, I said to my wife, oh, I'm thinking about getting like a uh, full like DJ setup. And she <laughs> went, yeah, I think that's a great idea because she thought I was joking. <laughs> so she was like, she was being sarcastic. She's going, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going to get your whole DJ set up in the house. Anyway, about a week later, the stuff arrived. She goes, are you fucking joking? I thought you were nice. winding me up. So anyway, now I'm about to set it up in the garage because I'm not allowed to have it in the house. So that's brilliant. Uh, Oh, I'm sort of getting into every it. boy's dream. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, what's your setup? What have you got? I've just got so Martin hooked me up with just like some little. I've just got this little pot. Basically, I've got a couple of turntables, like vinyl turntables, yeah. and I've got um, and I've got uh, the little kind of electronic like Pioneer setup as well. Just nice. because, just because I thought I don't know how much I can commit to crate digging. <laughs> you know the amount of space I'm taking up in the house at the moment. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know how much I can I can do. So I'm sort of dabbling with both at the moment. So uh, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> nice. We'll it goes. Man. What's your vinyl collection like? Have you got much? Well, I've got a fair bit, but not from like DJ, not from DJ. Really, it's just that I like buying vinyl, yeah. and also. You just, I don't know, just whenever I see, there's something, I mean, I'm talking i am talking to a hip hop head about this, so we're yeah. sort of, well, I'm preaching to the converted, but, <laughs> you know, the physical aspects of vinyl, I think are so addictive, do you know what I mean? And the whole thing of like pulling a, a record out of a sleeve, I think nothing can really match that, do you know what I mean? And yeah. I think it is amazing. I think it's amazing the way that music has gone now. If you recommend an artist to me now that I've not heard of, Within a minute, I can be listening to the music of that. Of that. I, I, I do yeah. think that's incredible. I do think it's really great. But there is something about that I feel slightly heartbreaking for the artists about how disposable our attitude is towards music now. Do you know what I mean? And I, yeah. and I talk about it's this, kind of all single culture as well. Isn't it? Yeah, and I talk about it a lot on the podcast. But like, you know, the, the album artwork. And I remember like. I sound like such an old man now, but you know when like you buy an album and you fucking read every word yeah. of that inlay. Yeah. You know who produced every like track. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, you'd, you'd read all the thank yous at the end, do you know what I mean? And all that shit. Like it, you'd consume every fucking element of that because <laughs> I guess because that's the only thing you could afford yeah. for that week or that month or whatever. So you wanted to get the most out of it that you could. So, so the whole thing of like sitting there and putting a record on, even not for DJ, but just putting a record on and having it on. And I just think you end up listening to songs. That, there's so many times when you put an album on and you think this song's shit, <laughs> but you just have it on because it's on. And then by the end of it, but you know, give it a week or something. That's your favorite song yeah. on the album. It's, a it's um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> So what's your gems in your collection, man? What's the vinyls that you, where you're really proud that you've got them? Uh, well, do you know what? It's just, I've got a load of old, like I, I went for a phase of everybody bought me breaks compilations from my, <laughs> nice. from my old records. Like, I went for a phase of like, I'd go to gigs and the promoter would go, oh, I, I saw this at a record shop and I thought you might like it. <laughs> like, give me this. So I've got, I, you know what? If I wanted to become a producer, 
I reckon I've got the arsenal. I, I reckon I, I <laughs> could do it. All I need is a all I need is a requisite talent. That's the only problem. <laughs> You've dabbled with production, I haven't. Well, I, I, I sort of, um, to be honest with you, I kind of um, you try and fuck around with everything. But the thing is, is that I don't want to insult people who are actually involved in hip hop and actually know what they're doing. I don't think I can be a rapper. I don't think I can be a DJ. I don't think I can be a producer. What I do do is like piss about with it. It's the same way that you might take a football down the park. Do you know what I mean? I don't yeah. think I can I can play for Arsenal, but I'm gonna have a laugh at doing it because I love football so much. It's the same thing with hip hop. I love hip hop production, so why wouldn't I mess have a little bit it. of a go at yeah. yeah, mess around with it. I don't have any I don't think I'm gonna be I'm not doing it thinking Oh fucking! I'm gonna phone up Primo <laughs> because I think I'm the next big deal or whatever. It's not anything like that. It's just a thing of like, I love hip hop so much, so why not have a bit of a mess around with it? Do you know what yeah. I mean? And like, you know, I think I think that's where it comes from. It doesn't come from. I wouldn't want anyone to think that I think I've got a talent at it. I don't. and I'm part like Tabasco. I'm at the Belasco backstage at Lupe Fiasco. I love Lupe, but Lupe don't know me, so I'm gonna announce and pronounce my name slowly. Ramesh Ranga Nathan, hip hop is my heaven. An Uber driver told me I look like a working 7-Eleven. I come rotten like a sheep shagging some mutton. My style is super memorable, your style is soon forgotten. It's not on, I rock on, any track I drop on. Scary like a prison guard about to strap his cock on. I come wicked like the devil's ejaculate. The immaculate conception of my form is uncompassionate. Mediocrity, hypocrisy or monotony. Stepping to me first in the cipher is false economy. Ask your friends about me, they'll tell you that I'm the nicest. I've got flavour like 11 herbs and squash. I just think that the only thing I've never really tried is breaking. Do you know what I mean? I, I just thought I just thought <laughs> yeah. of that is beyond. Uh, yeah, same. I think I attempted a windmill and nearly snapped my neck and thought, no, <laughs> no, not this one. I know, I know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, this this corner can stay over there. Uh, exactly, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> How did the podcast like Hip Hop Save My Life come about? Like, where where did that come from? Well, it's a it's a bit of a weird one because. Um, so what happened was, is years ago, when I first started doing stand-up, they did this, and they still do it, um, this thing called the Camden Fringe, which is like Edinburgh, the Edinburgh Festival, but in Camden, right? Yeah. All these different venues that have comedy going on. And there's Rupert, who's on the podcast now, who's runs a podcast with me. He's a, he still is a comedy, he's a comedy producer and comedy promoter. And he'd said to me, oh, he booked me to go and host uh, one of his venues, like later on in the evening, right? Yeah. So um, I saw him in the morning, I said to him, I'm going to go off, I had a load of gigs that day. All the comedians were doing like shit loads of gigs that day. Right? So we went off, I went off and did my gig. And then I came back and um, we, I came back that evening to host his gig and it was fucking carnage, right? Like <laughs> the crowd were going absolutely mental. They were smashed, right? They're absolutely battered. And um, they weren't listening to what anybody on stage was saying, right? So I was like, fuck me, this is like the gig from hell. <laughs> so I went up to Rupert and I said to him, what the fuck are we going to do, man? And I said, this is like mental. And he goes to me, look, he goes, why don't we just try something to try and grab their attention? Like, and because Rupert's obviously a hip hop fan and he mm -hmm. knew that I was a hip hop fan. And he goes, let's try and like do something hip hop comedy thing. So I went, all right, fine. Let, you know, it, it can't go any worse than what's happening <laughs> now, which is essentially people throwing their shit on stage. So I went up on stage and I started like just um, doing like, I, I, I can't, I, I started just doing hip hop jokes and Rupert was on the decks backstage. And every time I'd do a joke that would, that involved a lyric of a tune, Rupert would start playing a segment of that tune. It was a bit like, do you remember that Bernie Mac routine? I don't know if you remember, Bernie Mac did a comedy routine where he had, uh, I think it was uh, Kid Capri yeah. was at the back of the room. Playing and the like, he would like, he would go like, kick it! And then Kid Capri would like drop in a little beat. So it was a bit like that. And it really got their attention, right? So then, after that, we started running a, a hip hop comedy night with, um, called Dom in uh, Shoreditch, right? And it was like yeah. all the comics would come on and we'd have rappers on, like Doc Brown did it and uh, Big Ted was DJing. And then um, we would like, all the comics would talk about hip hop during their set. They'd write a specific set about rap music and their <laughs> love of hip hop and shit like that. But the problem with that is you, we ran out of people to do it so quickly, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and they're also getting comics, yeah, getting comics who are lazy 
to write a set specifically for one gig is just not the way. Do you know what I mean? yeah. So anyway, we ended up knocking Dong on the head. But um, but then we're just saying, oh, it's a shame that we're not doing anything. And then we just then we just said, oh, why don't we just do a podcast? And we knew Mark Smith. He was a comic. He's a comic, still comic, but he was like really into his hip hop. And we just sat in Rupert's office with a couple of mics <laughs> and just interviewed Mark. And we didn't have any ambitions for it. In fact, I think like we were so unambitious with it. I think there's a year between episode one and two of that podcast. <laughs> I think like that's how like slack we were about doing it. But we just that's didn't have any ambition. For it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is the Hip Hop Saved My Life podcast. Thank you for listening to the podcast. Hope you enjoy the podcast. Let's sit back because it's time for the podcast. But just we didn't have any ambition for it. We didn't have any intentions, like, you know, to make it into a thing. And then just gradually, it just started to, like, pick up a following. And uh, look, it's not massive now, but it's turned into something that has led to like people asking to come on and yeah. you know just like the other week I got I was like really lucky because they were doing um, a 25th anniversary of Illmatic and they picked people that they thought were like contributed to hip hop in, in like the hip hop scene in the UK yeah. to send a gold disc to and I got sent one I was like fucking wow. hell like this is amazing <laughs> they didn't have a spare one for Rupert sadly which was great uh, um, you but, um, like but yeah stuck a post it on uh, <laughs> not yours <laughs> Um, so yeah, so it's like, you know, it's um, it's a really nice because we just didn't have any, there was no professional desire to turn it into anything and yeah. we've been asked that we, you know, we got approached once to turn it into like a radio show or a, even like maybe a TV thing, but we've just always resisted, we just sort of thought, well, we're kind of happy doing it as a podcast and also doing the live shows which we started doing as well, they're just such a laugh. So it's more, you know, we pretty much, the only money we make from it, we end up kind of putting back into it, really. It's sort of, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a project, it's a passion project rather than a, a thing that we're trying to turn any financial uh, results out. Nice, man. You say it's pretty much all of your guests, but have you actually got a favourite guest? Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know, actually. I don't, all the guests are different for different reasons. Yeah. You know I mean? and, one of the things we had to get used to very quickly is like, because we had comics on initially, and then we started having rappers on, and then you know we're having producers on and blah blah blah. We had to just, we had to just trust that the listener knew that sometimes you get a funny episode and sometimes you get a muso episode, yeah. and they were just vary, and you're not always gonna, you're always not necessarily gonna get. Like for example, we had Tom Davis on, yeah. who was like, you know, Tom Davis from Merger Successful and King Gary, and his episode's hilarious. But Tom doesn't know fuck, he knows absolutely nothing about hip hop, <laughs> do you know what I mean? But it was still a funny episode. Whereas then we had Jest on. Yeah. And Jess he was quite you know, Jess is a yeah, Jess is a funny bloke, but he was talking about his journey in UK hip hop and how he felt about it. And there weren't a lot of laughs in the episode, but we still thought, well, you're still that's still a great episode, but for very different reasons. To the reason that Tom's episode was good, do you know what I mean? So yeah. it's like a, so it's difficult to say who my favourite guest was. I guess like I mean Frankie Boyle's probably up there, do you know what I mean? Because he's so into it. Yeah. And he had that amazing theory about Biggie and Tupac living as gay <laughs> still being alive as gay lovers. <laughs> and like he had actual evidence to back it up. Which seems legit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> he, he stands up, but loads of people. I mean, we just had um, Choosy, who did yeah. this amazing album last with year, Exile. Black Beans, yeah. with Exile, yeah. And he just, it was such a great way that happened. So I put together a Spotify playlist of like my favourite stuff from last year. And I guess they get notified when their songs are being attached to playlists or something, but he just saw, and he got in touch with me on Instagram and said, um, hey, I, thank, I just want to say thank you for putting on this playlist. And I said, no man, listen, it's like one of my favourite albums of last year. And I said, um, if you're ever in the UK, please come on the podcast. And then he just goes, oh, actually, I'm on holiday there in a couple of weeks' time. <laughs> and so then, like, we ended up getting choosy on the podcast. And um, it was just amazing, like, it, such, it happened so organically, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And he was like a really funny bloke. And we got to hear about how he came to put that album together and, it, and how long it took to put that album, that record together. It was an amazing insight. So you, you, it constantly, that podcast, doing that podcast constantly gives you 
little nuggets like that. Do you know what I mean? It's great. I love doing that. No, it's amazing, man. I mean, it, it is such a good show, and it's it's really nice as a hip hop head, as you say, to like kind of have that that element to it because it just doesn't feel like there's. I guess it's it's not no thrills in a negative way. It's just it's yeah. pure hip hop. It's just a, a yeah. route every single time. It's kind of like you say, yeah. even if it's a guest who doesn't understand, it doesn't really matter because yeah. then you guys rip it out and not really know it. Yeah. And like, it's yeah. kind of, but it's, the, the, the thing is, the, the problem we have with it, to be honest with you though, mate, is that um, you know we we you're you're catering to quite a wide experience range when it comes to hip-hop so like you know there'd be people like yourself that might listen to it that know their shit backwards yeah and then there'd be other people that might not even know a lot of the artists that we're talking about so it's kind of you know trying to find the line of where you pitch it and we kind of just thought well let's talk about it at our level of understanding and if people hear something they don't they've not heard of and hopefully they'll they'll check it out for themselves you know what i mean so we thought there's no point trying to pretend to be some encyclopedia who's explaining to everybody you know the the history of pharaoh monch or whatever do you know what i mean in his bio or you, you can yeah. find that out elsewhere do you know what i mean it's just a matter of like sort of just talking about it from our point of view really that's kind of the way we decided to pitch it no it's good man obviously like you say you've been doing a podcast but you've had a love of this this side of things for years i mean have you got any newer producers or artists that are coming through that you're you're starting to watch at the moment who you're excited about i don't know about newer i mean i think that i mean i mentioned i just mentioned him but i think i think exile is 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 fucking amazing (laughs) and and um you know, obviously everybody, I assume everybody sort of heard that, uh, the, 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 the Blue and Exile oh, record. Blow the Heavens is one um, of my favourites, man. Yeah, it's so hey. good. Yo, the soul provider, got a lot on the skillet, grilling it hard, ball, shark, cold feelings, the dark villain, and the light skinned, the niggas disguise, my mind sickening, the fine vicious written in rhymes, time tends it to describe how my lines end it. Your fine imprint, described in your mind's index. My lines and checks and shine through your blinds instant. The sun syndicate, fat as biggie with no pun intended. No pun intended to live. I pick up where we slid and run endless till I buckle and become windy. And all the air from my, my lungs slips into the sky like weed smoke. My peoples need hope and I'm the one with it. The soap provider, cold as fire, hot as ice. Rock the mic till I retire, die the son of Christ. Becoming one with life and live like death is uncertain. One curtain left and I'ma die with my gun bursting. Sun cursed. Until I must become one with the earth Heaven and hell, I conquer whichever comes first Known to rebel, my soul a la mode uh, My soul a la mode And then when, when I, when I talked to um, When I talked to Choosy About how um, how Exile puts that You know, his, his process They're obviously not fucking about Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. It's not about making an album that's going to be good for today It's like it's like they're trying to make it a proper creative project. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. so um, it was really, it was really fascinating to me to see, to, to listen to him talk about that. So I, I'm really into, uh, I'm really, I'm really big fan of Exile. And then again, not new, but somebody that I've only really um, just kind of realised how good they are is uh, Koji Radical. Yeah. And um, um, he's just somebody that a lot of my friends had told me about and I'd listened to Koji's stuff a little bit and I thought it was good but um, I somebody said to me you need to listen to his late his, I think it's Cashmere Tears was the last one he did um, and then I went back and checked out all of his stuff and I just think it's it's, it's fucking great man do you know what I mean yeah. it's, um, it kind of combines everything really, doesn't it it's a really unusual sound in that sense where it's, it's kind yeah of... well I don't really like I don't you know obviously artists hate being compared to other people but <laughs> You know, in, it is sort of a, a Kendrick in a way, in terms yeah. of like his influences and and all of that stuff. Um, I, I tell you, who else I think is fucking amazing, and, and I like all of the stuff that that they do. But um, Leaf Dog uh, from Four Hours, yes. and uh, he just did that album live from the Bullrog Chamber, uh, and I just think his production is fucking great, man. And yeah, definitely. Um, and I know, you know, I know he's not new. He's been doing it for ages. But I think like his perfectionism. You know, I, I, I sort of got an opportunity to have a little chat with him about putting that album together, and um, he just doesn't allow shit to go on his records. You know what I mean, like <laughs> it doesn't matter 
how much work he's put into it. If it's not good enough, it's not good enough, and he just fucks it off. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's um, um, it, it's pretty amazing. Um, it's pretty amazing. But I guess that's the thing, isn't it? I mean, that's why things like High Focus are done so well, and with the owls and that side, like they just, it's that that constant ambition to know that it needs to be perfect each and every time. Yeah, uh, but but I, I do find that surprising in a way. I, I know that people. What I mean by that is is that the, the, the level, the eye for detail that they've got and the amount of work that they're willing to put in, you know, and that's not because they think that's going to get them more sales or whatever. They're just doing it because they're driven by excellence. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. They just want it to be as, as good as it possibly can be. So, you know, I, I really do have a lot of respect for that. Another guy whose work I've become uh, only familiar with recently is a guy called Stu Bangers. Do you know that producer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so he did a, he, he did an album with Ill Bill called Cannibal Hulk, mm. um, which I would describe as divisive. I I think it's <laughs> unbelievable, but then I recommended it to on Hip Hop Save My Life, and loads of people said it was excellent. And somebody said to me, "I will never listen to a recommendation of yours again <laughs> after going to that album." This is a drive by. Hit five guys and leave extra catch a professional head seven. You know that the seven deadly sins I already did. Uh -huh. Got a brand new sub 2000 with the scope mount kit. Uh -huh. They say self, you just playing, you won't really pop off. What? Then they head start leaking that pace picante sauce. I envision three dimensional crime scenarios like a computer chip hardwired to stereos. Possess ya. Mind, body, and soul. I know it probably get old. Hearing these flows about homicides and hoes. Stu Bangs, I started following on Instagram, and he's constantly um, just putting beats that he's been working but Stu Bang he looks like he's, I don't have you ever seen do you know what he looks like no I don't I mean, think he, I do he's just he's just, he's just like absolutely fucking massive Tom white geezer <laughs> who looks like I hope he doesn't I mean I'm sure oh well he probably will mind me saying this but I'm going to say it anyway <laughs> he looks like he's about to go and fire up the barbecue <laughs> out back do you know what I mean I mean he's like <laughs> and it would just be it would just be um He'll just come on and do an Instagram post and it's just him playing in a beat and it's fucking amazing. <laughs> and, it, and you just can't believe that he looks like that and he's producing stuff like this. It's amazing, but all of his all of his beats are wicked. That's I've awesome. become a huge fan. I wonder yeah. if there's like any librarian producers out there. Like, I think that's that's kind of the one niche that hasn't been covered so far. Where, there like, must be, man. There, there, there must, must be, be somewhere. It, yeah. it requires that level of study, doesn't it? Yeah, it's true. I guess I mean? we're all like, geeks. It's just that it's... Yeah. Uh, we all yeah. try and claim that we're cool and like, yeah, yeah, but yeah. it's something good. Yeah. It's, yeah, uh... 100%, yeah. <laughs> On that tip, man, I mean, how did your books come about? What was the motivation for writing with that side of things? Well, basically, the truth is that came from uh, me reading books by comedians in the past. So, for example, I'd read Steve Martin's book. Yeah. And then I'd read Frank Skinner's book. And I really enjoyed both of them. And, I, and I'm really into Richard Pryor, so I'd read Richard Pryor's well, there's loads of books written about Richard Pryor, which I've read most of. And, uh, you know, his book as well, I read that. And I really liked, as a comedy fan, I really liked reading about the journey, for want of a less wanky word, that these people are taking to, to get to where they were. And so I, it started occurring to me that maybe I'd want to write a book, but I hadn't really given it a lot of thought. And then, obviously, after, you, you know, your profile hits a certain point, you get publishers asking the question. And I've been asked a couple of times, in the past and thought, oh, I haven't got, I can't really see it or I don't really know if I can, not that I can be bothered, but it's like, you just sort of think, oh, maybe I'm probably too thick to write, but that's, that's the honest truth. You, <laughs> you sort of think about people that write books and you think it's intelligent, worthy, verbose people. You don't think yeah. it's some fat moron. <laughs> you know I mean? so, so I just did, so, but anyway, in the end, we ended up chatting about it and I just sort of thought, oh yeah, you know what? It could be a laugh. So I ended up writing this book straight out of Crawley. And then um, it was going to be, to be honest with you, it was just going to be a book of funny things that have happened, mm -hmm. you know, in my life. But it ended up being a bit more than that. It ended up being like, you know, there's some like shit that my mum and dad went through and stuff. Mm -hmm. So we, I, I ended up including that in it. Because I wanted to give people that read the book something that I'd never talked about elsewhere. So there's a reason to buy the book, do you know what I mean? But over and above it just being a transcription of my stand-up or whatever. So I sort of talked about personal stuff in that. And yeah, so and it ended up being really fun. So it's kind of, it, it takes a little bit of discipline. I, my attention span is, is really minimal. And so um, I would kind of, there would be days when I would sit and like really get into it and spend the whole day writing. 
and then the next day I could only bring myself to spend an hour or half an hour looking at it and then I'd get distracted by watching Rick and Morty or something like that. <laughs> you know? So it really did vary from day to day but we ended up doing a hip hop thing for that as well actually because we decided to, um, I was trying to think of names for the chapters and then we just ended up making them um, hip hop tunes. So every chapter is named after a hip hop tune or a hip hop lyric. Yeah, it's nice sort of, the way he's done that locked up in isolation have you found like any kid friendly stuff that you're able to play where you're thinking yes I, I still feel hip hop so I put together on Spotify a kid friendly hip hop list nice because this is like an ongoing situation I've had because my wife I think I remember the day I had Eminem on in the car and um, and my wife turned to me and she goes the kids are going to get old they're old enough now to start repeating this stuff you, you can't you can't put swearing on in the car anymore. We had a discussion about it. Yeah. And um, and I sort of thought, well, do you know what? I don't feel strongly enough about this to, to carry on. So then I just thought, oh, I'm going to start looking for clean stuff. The truth is, the problem with trying to find kid-friendly hip-hop is that it's all the older stuff that's clean and all the newer stuff isn't. So you end up, when you put together a kid-friendly list, it ends up being like a fucking cash money mixtape. <laughs> so it's like, it's like all this fucking really old school shit. So yeah, I've tr I've tried to um, I've tried to get the kids into into clean hip hop, but um, they keep listening to shit because they because like they're into TikTok, right? Yeah. So TikTok is like it does have hip hop on those videos, but it's all stuff like Doja Cat yeah. and Little Yachty and Little Nas X and all that shit. So um, <laughs> I find it very difficult to um, to deal with. Yeah, it's it's not quite hip hop, really, is it? It's like you just no. kind of listen to it and, and grit your teeth. Yeah, I mean that Doja Cat. I've I've heard that bitch boss track. I reckon a million times in the last week because it's on, <laughs> it's on every single uh, t TikTok video. And yeah. like, listen, I don't think it's terrible. I think it's fine. It's definitely not for me. But like my kids being into, I sort of think, well, you know, it's I, I, it's not, I don't find it offensive. Yeah. It's just uh, I wouldn't particularly choose to put it on, but but Doja Cat would be fucking delighted. But I don't like it. I mean, Doja Cat is not trying to make music for me. She's not thinking. I hope a, I hope an overweight dad of three in Crawley gets really into this music. Oh, I don't wow. think I'm a target market. <laughs> your your family's from Sri Lanka, aren't they? So I mean, is there? Yeah. What's the scene like over there? Like, is there a is there a scene? There there is a very small scene in fact when we when we uh i did a travel show in sri lanka about uh must be five years ago now called asian provocateur where i went to sri lanka and the whole purpose of the show is to get back in touch with my roots but one of the things we thought was well let's you know my mum the, the whole premise of the show is that my mum sent me there to get in touch with my culture but then the argument with the 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 discussion we had with the producers was like there must be a side of Sri Lanka that my mum doesn't know because she's, she, you know, it's been years since she's been there. There must be a modern side to it. So we started looking for hip hop in Sri Lanka, and we found this hip hop group called Colombo MBs. Yeah. And I ended up doing a video. I ended up doing a verse on a tune with them, and we we put it in the the last episode. We filmed. We shot a video for it, but they weren't. Uh, we put it in the episode, so it's like we did it. My mum like had a little cameo on it and shit like that. And I went and did like went and did a rap battle with them in the first episode and then they came back for the last episode and we're in a video they were i think i don't think there's a massive scene but they were very much like i don't know how to explain it they were a hip-hop collective but it was like um i think they're a bit like maybe like black eyed peas it was kind of like okay. it was hip-hop they were rapping but there's also a lot of singing on it and shit like that they, they were good but it wasn't like i did we didn't find sri lanka's wu-tang do you know what i mean like put it that way <laughs> Yeah, fair enough. Is, is that track out? Uh, we didn't put it out as an app because obviously because it's awful. But um, <laughs> actually, I think it's on Netflix because that whole series is on Netflix. Yeah. So if you go to um, the last episode, well, the first episode is where you see me doing the battle with them, and then the last episode is where we do the video. That's it's brilliant. pretty dreadful. <laughs> <laughs> Is, is that the proudest battling moment about battle yeah, scars and exactly. everything? <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Oh man! On your podcast, Tip, are there yeah. any particular people that you really want to interview who you haven't yet? Me personally, I'd really like to interview somebody like a Pharaoh Monch yeah. or, or a, a Black Thought or even somebody like a Red Man. Like, well, Red Man and Pharaoh Monch are two of my favourite rappers of all time. Mm. Black Thought. The thing I think is interesting about Black Thought is that is that the roots have managed 
to stay, I think, relatively current. I know that they're a Jimmy Fallon's house band, but they've, you know, they have managed to stay current and interesting and exciting, but still be of, still have been around for ages. They've still got longevity as well. Do you know what I mean? And like, I think it's interesting because a lot of rappers that we love, people, you know, if you introduce them to a kid now or somebody younger, they just go, why the fuck would I ever want to listen to that? Whereas somebody like a Black Thought or something like that, I think that they still still have an appeal, do you know what I mean? Without having changed themselves in an embarrassing way. Like, Black Thought hasn't suddenly gone trap or anything like that, do you know what I mean? But like, but I I don't know. I I think that, and also the other thing is the thing about somebody like Black Thought or Ferro Monch is I'm just fascinated by their attitudes to hip hop. I, I had a chance to chat to Run The Jewels a few years ago um, for a TV show, we were filming with them. And their attitude to hip hop was so interesting, do you know what I mean? Because they do what they do and they've got no problem with any hip hop that anybody else is making. They just see it as, you know, some rappers are like, I think that's trash and I think that's shit and I don't want to even, you know, it really offends me that people like that are involved in the culture. Whereas they were like, you know, it is what it is. All these people make this different stuff and that's why hip hop's so great and that's why it's so diverse and I'm happy about that, do you know what I mean? So yeah. I think getting you know, getting somebody like a Black Thought or a Feral Monsters take on it would be really fascinating. I mean, they're quite elusive really, aren't they? It's like, it's, and it's kind of part of the appeal. I think that's part of it, do you know what I mean? And like, you know, Red Man, I, lo- I used to love Red Man and I still do love Red Man, but like, he's been like putting shit out himself. Like, he's like fucking... He's like, you know, he's like, he's become like almost like not on this same level. But for a while, he was operating like one of these guys that sell CDs on Oxford Circus. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, he was, he wasn't putting out, he wasn't putting out record label albums. He was putting yeah. out little mix CDs that you'd have to buy directly from his website. Do you know what I mean? And I remember yeah. I bought them like Giller House Volume One and Two and all that shit, and they were great. And I just love that kind of that shows you that he's doing it because there's fucking nothing else that that guy wants yeah. to do. Do you know what I mean? Like. He's just so into being an MC and putting stuff out. I just find that whole thing fascinating, man. I find it really, I don't know. I think, you know, it'd be interesting to get their take on and how it's all gone down, do you know what I mean? No, for sure. Kind of be quite grounding to understand it from that side. Yeah. Romesh, thank you so much for taking the time to, to talk no worries, to me with man. this Thanks man. I like, really appreciate it, and uh, yeah, thank you so much for your show as well. We, uh, appreciate we definitely appreciate it. It's uh, something oh, cheers, good man. to listen to on a weekly, monthly, or yearly basis, depending on when you post it. <laughs> <laughs> cheers, man. Thank you. But, yeah, yeah. Cheers, man. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. To find out more about each episode, including the tracks played, go to thefinemag.com.